Um, and so I, it is my, my honor, my pleasure, and with great gratitude that I introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Michelle Moody Adams. Uh, Professor Moody Adams is the Joseph Strauss Professor of Political Philosophy and Legal Theory at Columbia University. Uh, she served here as Dean of Columbia College and was Vice President for Undergraduate Education from 2009 to 2011. Professor Moody Adams has published articles on equality and social justice, moral psychology and the virtues, and the philosophical implications of gender and race. She's also the author of a widely cited book on moral relativism, fieldwork in familiar places, morality, culture, and philosophy. Her current work includes articles on academic freedom, equal educational opportunity, and democratic disagreement. She's at work on a book tentatively entitled Renewing Democracy, which could not have been faster. <laughs> no. um, uh, on the political institutions and political culture essential to achieving justice and promoting stability in multicultural democracies. She's been a British Marshall Scholar, an NEH Fellow, and is a lifetime honorary fellow of Somerville College, Oxford. Um, and so with that, I, I would just like to yeah, hand it over. Thanks so much, Amy. I'm really delighted to be here with you. So my interest in the issue of language justice emerges out of two aspects of my ongoing research. The first is that I have long sought to understand the connection between cultures and the individuals who can develop into responsible agents within those cultures. Notice I said can't develop. More recently, I've sought to articulate um, the conditions for renewing democracy in an age of extraordinary cultural, uh, ethnic, and doctrinal diversity a diversity that I think has been exacerbated and uh, you know, made more challenging by um, developments in technology and certainly by globalization that's in, you know, created a kind of unparalleled economic and I think social upheaval. Now it's important that unlike anthropologists and sociologists and linguists, uh, political philosophers and political theorists have only very recently started to produce systematic reflection on the topic of language justice. Uh, there's a 2011 book by the philosopher, um, the Belgian philosopher, Philippe von Parius, who is known best for his work on the universal basic income, but who is now uh, walked into the, the field with a book called Linguistic Justice for Europe mm -hmm. and for the World. Um, and in 2003, so quite a gap between 2003 and 2011, Will Kamlika, the multiculturalist philosopher, and Alan Patton edited the first philosophical anthology uh, in this area. It's called Language Rights and Political Theory. Now, I will add that at least since the 1990s, um, there has been discussion of relevant topics in uh, debates about communitarianism and multiculturalism on one side and a kind of liberal neutrality and liberal nationalism on the other. So it's not like nothing has been uh, talked about that's relevant. And some of my observations today uh, reflect my effort to build on those discussions, as well as on relevant work in the social sciences and in legal scholarship. So as I understand it, the issue of language justice raises two main problems. The first is that there's a challenge to find a just response to the presence of multiple language groups within larger political communities. Groups who may count as linguistic minorities but whose languages may or may not be in danger. And this challenge raises such concerns as whether there ought to be equality of recognition between different languages, um, whether that recognition, if it's equal, should involve official state multilingualism or monolingual territories within states, whether there ought to be support for linguistic minorities, I should say special support for them, or whether states should just leave all these worries behind and adopt one official, or at least one first language, that everyone in the territory is expected to learn and use. So that's one, uh, one set of problems. But second, there's the problem of finding a just response to the global phenomenon of truly endangered languages, some of which, as the uh, comments that came to me before my talk revealed, may in fact be unread. By most estimates, there are over just over 7,100 languages in the world, and the UNESCO Atlas of World Languages posits that between a quarter and a third of them currently have fewer than 1,000 speakers left. 
So the Atlas also estimates that every two weeks, one such language dies with its last speaker. Uh, and it's important that there are, they've been identifying uh, other groups as well, certain so-called language hotspots. And two of those hotspots where endangered languages are particularly uh, uh, prevalent are actually in the North American continent. Pacific Northwest and this Oklahoma Southwest region. So it's not far away from, from us wherever we are. Sometimes the threat is generated by state policies in some multilingual states, especially policies regarding elementary <coughs> education, policies which endanger the languages of indigenous peoples by denying them access to education in their native tongue. But even when that denial might be rooted in attention to other values that it's claimed are relevant to promoting social justice. Now, it's often argued that the concept of language rights provides the best vehicle for understanding and furthering the interests that are at stake in these two core problems of language justice. I'm not sure that they really solve the problems in the same, to the same degree, but it's thought that the idea of language rights is certainly relevant. And my, Remarks today are offered as a brief exploration of what might be at stake in taking this stance. And I'm going to kind of problematize the thought that language rights are the right way to go. So I begin by acknowledging the value of arguments linking the interests someone might have in language and in its preservation to the theoretical power and the relatively broad international acceptance of the idea of universal human rights. It's especially important that this idea has come to be associated with principles and norms that impose weighty obligations on states to protect important liberties and to provide access to important goods that people can be deemed to have simply in virtue of being human. But if, in theory, we link interests in language justice to the idea of human rights, we then have to wade into the debate about how best to achieve that link practice. Some theorists argue that language rights are implicit in or indispensable to civil and political rights, particularly universal language rights, implicit in uh, human rights that are civil and political. For instance, it might be said that if there is a universal right to freedom of thought and expression, shouldn't there be a right that protects one's use of and access to the language in which one learned to think and to talk? Or it might be said that if there's a universal right to freedom of association, there should surely be a right to use the language that shapes the communities with which one wants to associate, the communities of which one is a member and wants to associate. Now, the idea that such civil and political rights as freedom of expression and freedom of association are, in fact, universal has become fairly uncontroversial in the theoretical circles and in the national contexts where human rights are acknowledged at all. Others have thought that language rights might be better understood as social welfare rights, not civil and political, but social welfare rights, not unlike rights to such things as education, employment, health care, and food. Of course, there is sometimes resistance, I should say in theory and in practice, to the idea that states actually have obligations to provide such things but there are some states, as many member states of the EU, for instance, that have been willing to sign on to agreements containing commitments to a fairly robust set of such obligations. And language rights are sometimes specific components of those agreements. But second, at this point, we should ask whether it's really necessary to view language rights as a distinctive category of human rights, or whether, as I suggested earlier, language rights can, in fact, be implicit in or presumed to be presupposed by familiar categories, either civil and political rights or social welfare rights. And I'll say that, in, in my view, theorists like um, Fernand de Varenne, who think that we don't need to talk about a new um, category of human rights, actually have a slightly stronger case than scholars like Tove Skutnap Kangas, I think I've said her name properly, who think that we do. But this is mostly because I worry that expanding the category of human rights to bring language rights within its orbit may ultimately make it difficult to know where the expansions should stop. And that over time, the excessive proliferation of categories of human rights might weaken the sense of the weightiness of human rights overall. 
even further, I think there is a danger that treating language rights as human rights can lead to the view that the most trivial, I'm sorry, the most trivial sorts of wrongs regard language, regarding language can be properly treated as human rights violations. If Canadian francophones are unable to order their favorite soft drinks in French on a Canadian airline, should this really be viewed as a violation of a universal human right? I would argue it shouldn't, even though there have been some Quebecois who seem to think otherwise. The uh, Canadian Supreme Court pushed back against this. More generally, I urge that not every important obligation that the state has to its citizens needs to be understood as rooted in a universal human right. Now third, we need to consider that even if language rights might in fact be best understood as universal human rights, and maybe as in some sense inalienable, not every inalienable right should be treated as absolute. Suppose, for instance, that we could convincingly show that there is a universal right to learn one's mother tongue. There's still no obvious reason to think that that right can never be justifiably overridden. Consider the possibility that in some contexts, protecting that right against being overridden might endanger quality of opportunity and employment, it might undermine the right to democratic participation, or it might put a state in a position to choose between providing instruction in the mother tongue and providing, say, basic health care. Now, that may not be a typical choice, but it could, in principle, be one. Now, I'm not claiming here to know how to solve the thorny real-life problems about what counts as justice in the area of language and education policy. I'm particularly not weighing in on whether people in the U.S., for instance, who are um, children of native Spanish speakers should be taught Spanish, to be taught in a school in, in Spanish. I'm not trying to weigh in on that here. I'm simply emphasizing that calling something a human right doesn't <coughs> establish that the right should always override other weighty rights and interests. Fourth, there is a pressing concern that talk about rights virtually always tends to privilege individualistic approaches to the interest or the good protected by the right. And if what we hope to do is safeguard an interest in preserving certain kinds of connections between individuals and linguistic communities, we must ask whether a typically individualistic rights-based approach can make sense of the interests and goods at stake, let alone safeguard them. Now it's true that there have been numerous efforts, though they're still quite controversial, to defend the idea of group rights and defend group rights of various sorts. Even if we, however, can provide a compelling defense of group rights, and I, I'm not saying here that it's not possible or even likely, we might still wonder whether some of the important obligations that states have to safeguard welfare, even of groups, and the interests of groups can be properly understood in terms of rights. Can that concept capture the moral depth of the obligation to care about the cultural, historical, and even psychological isolation and alienation of the lone individual left as the only speaker of an endangered language? And sometimes you see them stand, you know, they, they may have access to some other language, but the idea that nobody who knows the native tongue is there to talk with them, that's an extraordinary situation to be in. Um, does the idea of a rights violation make sense of the loss and the sense of loss experienced when linguistic minorities find themselves at risk of being cut off from their communal past and from their capacity to fully understand and steward the natural world that has sustained them over time? I think what we need is a sense of what it means to be cut off from an important component of one's identity and in addition, a sense that the, the losses associated with being cut off in this way can sometimes be our losses too. That is, we need moral concepts that emphasize the importance of human solidarity and relatedness. And I just doubt that the idea of rights, whether individual or collective, could ever be appropriate to the task. And I have to say, I don't at this point have a clearer picture 
of how to succinctly label that concept. I have some ideas about how it works in a particular national context. But I want to argue that some of the obligations we have with regard to language do extend beyond the boundaries of any nation state, um, and you know, particularly on the issue of endangered languages across the globe. But I think we need to explore the possibility that there's some way of bringing together this moral weight of this requirement to care about our relatedness and about human solidarity in a way that whites cannot capture. Now, I refer to the complex connections between language, especially what is often called the mother tongue, or the native tongue, on one hand, and identity on the other. And I think this raises a fifth problem for the theorists of language rights as universal human rights. Now, there are contemporary political theorists. I have in mind people like Charles Taylor and Will Kimlicka who insist that language groups just are communities of identity, shaping our most fundamental sense of who we are, our connections to others and the world we inhabit. Uh, and I think it's interesting that, that they're relying on a range of views, I'm moving a little beyond the text for a moment, on their work of you know, the 18th century uh, philosopher Herder, on the nature of language and identity and culture and their links together, on the work of Gautamer as the kind of end point of a kind of hermeneutic tradition where Gautamer talks about language as the limits of our horizon, although Gautamer does have a not entirely relativistic understanding of the possibility of you know, our horizons expanding in response to dialogue with others. And also, I think in ways it isn't always acknowledged, with the debate uh, that began in the early 20th century over the so-called St. Peter Wharf hypothesis, the idea of a kind of erratic linguistic relativism. I think all these views, Taylor and Kimlicka, are always, they're, they're in this universe of these views and they're not always sure where they want to come down on the relativistic versus, you know, possibility of universal communication side. I would add that there are people like uh, Joseph Ross and Abishai Margulit who have talked in discussing national uh, in, in discussing national determination and so forth, they've also talked about the importance of language and identity as uh, interwoven. But there is a problem because even though I think when these claims about language and identity being interwoven um, are compellingly argued, they can have entirely salutary implications for political life. I, and I don't think in the end we can do without them. But Kimlicka goes on to argue that once we understand the connection between language and identity, then we're required to supplement any theory that claims their individual human rights with a theory, theory of minority group rights. He holds that cultures, which he suggests are largely defined by shared language, are fundamentally contexts of choice, and that to be denied access to central elements of one's native culture is to be denied access to the conditions of individual autonomy. In fact, he's offering a defense of minority rights that he believes can be accommodated within liberal political thought. And whether or not you think that's an important project, you know, even if you accept Kimlicka's liberal assumptions or don't, I think there are still problems with his stance. How, for instance, do we decide the boundaries of those groups who genuinely deserve full-fledged language rights, especially when dialects of a single language can multiply in unexpected ways over time? I don't think that's a bad thing. It just is a thing. <laughs> Even if we agree on the boundaries of groups that deserve substantive, robust language rights in a multilingual context, how do we adjudicate between the claims of those deserving groups when to try to satisfy their claims, to address them, could well lead to, to uh, fundamentally conflicting policy decisions? Kimlicka acknowledges, this is in the book on multicultural citizenship, he acknowledges that some such conflicts cannot be eliminated. But as I have argued in discussing the concept of abortions, I talk about this in your work and in other places, Sometimes resorting to the language of moral rights oh, leads to an endless moral tug of war, a situation that makes our disagreements seem rationally irresolvable when they may in fact not be so at all, 
And in so doing, I think this tug of war actually relieves us of the responsibility, I think, to seek what I've come now to call reciprocal reimaginings of political life, on which political conflict doesn't have to be seen, as it is often now, as a zero-sum game. In this case, a game in which we, as speakers of a dominant language, can win only if they, members of a linguistic minority, somehow lose out. And I think vi the viral videos of native English speakers in the US screaming at deli patrons for talking to each other in Spanish are just one manifestation of the problem I have in mind. My rights to hear everything in English need to trump your rights to be able to speak Spanish with your compatriots. And the kind of conflict, frankly, that we have here is the kind of conflict that is morally crucial for us to try to avoid. I don't know how to do it. I think this idea of human of solidarity and relatedness, um, sometimes at the local, domestic level now, is part of it. Um, but there is a lot of work to be done. <coughs> but finally, taking a truly global perspective, the phenomenon of endangered languages suggests additional reasons, I think, for worrying that the idea of language rights may be of limited value. I've already suggested that what we might call the identity interests of speakers of endangered languages, understanding how their identity is linked with their linguistic membership in linguistic communities, that those identity interests are better captured by a language of compassionate concern and potential human solidarity rather than by the concept of rights. Then I, I, I want to add here that it matters that what is endangered when languages disappear is often some critical element of what we ought all to understand and I think to care about as a common human inheritance. By this I mean things like ways of knowing the natural world or understanding our place in it that too often die along with the I have to say that I appreciate the opportunity to think about this. I had never formulated that way of thinking about this um, before for myself. Uh, I note in closing that one casualty of widespread lack of concern about endangered languages is a general loss of respect for language and especially the power of language, I think, in general. Of course, this respect for the power of language tends to be greatest in those communities where living languages are oral rather than written. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, Walter Ong has written about this. Um, Marshall McLuhan, in his own way, <laughs> has written about this. Mm -hmm. I have come to think that in the end, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a sentence. Ironically, this means that efforts to save some endangered languages by creating a writing system where none existed before may tend to actually deprive that language of some of its power. But I've also come to think that in the end, this might be a small price to pay for preserving our human inheritance and protecting at least some of the identity interests of the relevant speakers. But I remain convinced that the strongest argument for doing what's necessary to make these things happen are not likely to come in the form of appeals any kind of language rights. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, Professor Williams, thank you so much. Oh. I, I kind of feel like you, you just shot light through a prism and I'm just kind of oh. dazzled right now. I, I, I actually, I had a certain set of questions before and I think I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll get to questions. some of them, but uh, the, the, the paper itself, of your talk, or these uh, thoughts and process, which I haven't seen before, have also opened up many other ideas. Um, and I'm sure I, I, I speak for many of us in that. And so I'm, I'll try not to, to uh, completely monopolize this, even though I, I, I would be that greedy. So um, they're all quite scattered. Um, I, so I'll jump around a bit, uh, and please forgive me on this. but. Um, I guess one one thing that comes to mind with the cautionary approach you have towards the rights framework uh, actually reminds me of something that I think uh, we tend to forget, uh, which I certainly haven't really mentioned that, which is that 
the founding fathers and the, well, all the fathers, essentially, of the US were actually quite hesitant to adopt the Bill of Rights. And I, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, that, and so it's, there, there is something to that, maybe, something, something telling me about going back to that history and asking why, you know, it's like, because we don't actually think of that as it's so much, and so, uh, in part because the way uh, ideologies have developed, how the political system has developed, how, you know, the feeling of, of the expanded government versus the contracted government, those are very polarized conversations now, and there isn't really a space in which to kind of have a, a question of, really working out the, the ramifications of of, uh, of extending that kind of power or that or opening that sphere of legality, which might actually shut off <coughs> a critical, yet another way we can step out and act, actually think about legitimacy. So there's kind of that, that tension there. So, so that's just kind of a thought, and there's a question embedded in there somewhere. Um, also, yeah, I guess since you, you ended on, on uh, a reflection of, of oral versus, versus uh, inscription or, or textual, textuality versus orality, I mean, this has been something that has, has come up across all of our, um, our talks um, and, our, and our, the ways that we've been approaching it, um, or definitely as, as a, an aporia. Um, and actually, it, this kind of, uh, um, I have had the, the, the pleasure of reading a book, and I would highly recommend it to everyone. I think this, I, so I'm definitely not a philosopher. I, I have not, I've never taken a philosophy class, but I found it to be incredibly accessible and, and generous um, at explaining both the, you know, the, 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 the field of philosophy, but there is also a reach towards anthropology, and I think it's really fascinating. I almost, I, so I actually studied anthropology as an undergrad. I kind of wish it was a text. It, um, but I guess one, so, I think in that book more so, um, because you were leading, you one of your uh, initial interlocutors in anthropology is Cooper Geertz, right? And so he he's an anthropologist who I had just kind of pioneered the whole thick description. Um, thing. But I guess one of my my questions is, is there is one of the obstacles for language the fact that we can that the predominant a paradigm is still text. Culture is text. Uh, at best, or with least damage, thinking of text as culture is less dynamically relational of a way of thinking, right? Absolutely. But Absolutely. I think at worst, what what comes becomes an issue with culture as text, right, is the erasure of the marks of labor. Because the, the text, literally, just like now, you know, thinking of what the metaphor is actually talking about, um, it's an object. It becomes fetishized. It can become something that you know is reified. There's a there, there's, so there's a reification that happens there. So I was maybe if you could, uh, yeah, elaborate on that. And then I think that <laughs> I, 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 I sorry, a lot. sorry, sorry. No, I'm, I'm just writing yeah. them down, and I'll come okay. to them in order. Okay, okay. <laughs> and actually, well, so I, but I, I'll add one one more thing to that. Okay. Um, just a point of interest for everyone, but also in, in trying to you know, collectively think towards maybe. Awakening the language beyond the text, or how how language and information would be on text. Uh, just today, this morning, I, I read that um, there's a there's a controversy currently over uh, a children's comic book that has come out mm. in uh, in French. In, it's in France uh, that's trying to explain to uh, elementary school and, and middle school, probably middle school kids, about how the EU works. Uh, and it's and it's really interesting as to the kind of. Uh, Debates that are emerging over that, the way that things are, are not just um, framed in terms of language, but literally framed in terms of the image that this this children book writer is, you know, the, has made. It's a comic book. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that, I thought that anyway, just to kind of add right. to the textuality, orality, and other ways. Of okay. Um, and then my final one before opening it up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this this one is is it's um it's tricky and it's a very inchoate thought, but. Um, we've had uh, Professor Mary Louise Pratt was, I think, our, our last speaker to come during the winter, and so she's a complet, she's right? Yes, comparative literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, she, she also approached the, this question of, of uh, uh, took on the, the provocation that has been a huge part of global language justice, the ecological 
this at the same time. Um, and she talked about diversity, biodiversity, and linguistic diversity. right? Linguistic diversity, um, which yeah, is yeah, it's been a fantastic scaffolding for us. Um, and also mentioned that there's there's a kind of moral outrage about this, the feeling that languages are dying. There's it, to say that there's something that feels like a not a dilemma, it's something, it's something it's tragic, it's you know, hugely tragic. Uh, and I, I'm just wondering because this, you know, I can't think of another field of, outside of philosophy that has probably thought more thoroughly through this really loaded question I'm about to ask, which is that I'm wondering if the sense of moral outrage is somewhat attached to the feeling that there's a committing of suicide that's happening. Hmm. Like there's an actual, like something suicidal is happening. For the species, for, or for, for the species, but but okay. it's but then it's refracted throughout these moments of this, you know, and unfairly on certain people, just as the same way that I think talking to someone who's considering to is it's very, like how how do you, you know, it's like, and but that's where the pressure is coming to you need to keep this language, right? Because it would be suicide, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so there's that, but also suicide in, in the in a more uh, and another metaphor would be is that. Language hegemony, having only one language, monolingualism, English, everyone speaking English, is also suicide. Because no one wants to be the last Galapagos tortoise, you're <laughs> going to go extinct, right? Okay. So, anyway, that's more of a stretch. But, it, okay. but in terms of, the, so those are some, I guess those are my initial questions. So yeah. could I take, yeah. I don't want to not have questions from other people, there but could be, I think I can do this, yeah. I think I can yeah. do this in a fairly okay. concise, but I hope, um, you know, not yeah. to surface sort of way. I mean, the question about rights is a really critical one. The Ninth Amendment to, in the Bill of Rights, of course, is the one that says, you know, our rights are not limited to the ones that are enumerated here in this document. And that's kind of the reappearance of the suspicion that to put a list in a, the document would be to suggest that this is all there is. I think there was also a worry that just what would happen, and they wouldn't have the vision of the kind of litigiousness that people have turned to, but maybe the kind of thing that comes out when somebody sues because they got a Sprite instead of a 7-Up on an Air Canada flight, that, oh gee, something that's really trivial, even though it involves your language not being respected, because there isn't a native speaker of French or a good speaker of French on your plane, the idea that that's really what your serious interest in language is about, mm -hmm. that rights may just not be able to capture everything. And it's interesting, the, the kind of parallel developments in political thought that are emerging in the 18th century just as rights are developing was a set of ideas that were trying to articulate the narrowness of the rights discourse. Not always comfortably, but Mill and Bentham Mill in particular resisting the idea that all that you needed to care about morally could be captured in rights. So it's that worry about delimiting, seeming to delimit too narrowly, yeah. and seeming to encourage the kind of trivial interpretation of the interests protected by the rights. On the question of morality, I have to say, this is really critical. I, I did want to say very quickly that, you know, one of the reasons Geertz's commentary on thick description is so interesting to philosophers is that he gets the phrase thick description and the idea from the philosopher Gilbert Ryle or the Oh yeah. Okay. And Ryle has these wonderful examples of, you know, looking across a room and seeing somebody moving their eye and are you is they are they winking? Are they, you know, just is there something in the eye and they're trying to get rid of it? And you can describe this event thickly, you know, thinly and if you describe it in certain ways, you're capturing all the, the context that gives it meaning or not. Mm -hmm. And that's the, so it's not unimportant that it comes from philosophy. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that the, the kind of tension between orality and, I don't like to say literacy, I'll say textuality. <laughs> Maybe that's better because literacy has all these moral, evaluative connotations. That tension is very deep and very old. And philosophy is one of the places where you see the tension expressed most fully. So, you know, Socrates did not, from what we know, believe in writing things down. And one of the reasons Plato picks the dialogue form, sometimes with more success than other times, is that he's trying in writing to capture the force of this dialogic engagement that Socrates thought was critical. Does he manage it and does he um, fully make the textu textuality capture it? I don't think you can do it. One last point about this is that one of the reasons I, I 
I need, feel like I need to write something, but I think I'd have too many people sending me awful hate mail. Because I believe in free speech, but I know why when a speaker comes to campus, even if that speaker has written material that's very incendiary and provocative and all the campus has read it, it's a very different thing to have an audience sitting in a room listening to the stuff being in, you know, um, boom, people talk about um, uh, synchrony between the speaker and the hearer, and they talk about entrainment, you know, like a mother and a child, and it kind of makes it more likely that they're drawn into the power of the word. Um, and so it doesn't mean it's right to silence the speaker, but at least we could acknowledge why it's one thing to have a person read a text, and another thing to hear the ideas in that text intoned, you know, mm -hmm. and orally. And that power of language, I think, is something we've never fully come to terms with. We try and suppress it. We try not to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's my second point. The third question about, um, so this worry about message, I guess this is what you're talking about being, is it better and more fully displayed sometimes by images? And pictures? Is that the worry about the textbook versus the actual words in, or is it the combination of image and word, or the mode of presentation that you think can sometimes make the difference? Because it's not unimportant that this is something that, you know, I know linguists think about it, but certainly philosophy, again, it goes back to Plato. Sometimes the most important ideas that we need to know and think about are the ones that we're going to remember best. So there's the oral, and you know, the rhythmic repetition and the memory and all that, but there's also the idea of an image or a metaphor. You know, the, me the image of the cave in the Republic, or the divided line, or all, all these ideas that we leave with and we never forget. Even if we end up rejecting Plato, there's a power to this way of concisely encapsulating what it would take lots of words to say that we have, I think, in our preference for textuality in our embeddedness in a world that puts the text in some way prior. And you talked about the distance. This was like to the other thing. Of course this is a distancing between the source of the message and the, the audience that, um, as I said, is reflected in the ways in which people are in a room and they hear things said and they react to it differently. And then finally, this was the worry about um, the, the idea of outrage at the possibility that letting languages die, given that our human, I call it our human inheritance, but that maybe we are implicitly involved in some kind of suicide, species side or something. <laughs> something that feels, yeah. feels, feels suicidal about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a complicated yeah. thing because I'm not Freudian, but I do believe there are. I actually made my yeah. I don't believe there are these there are these kind of um, I don't call it instincts, but forces at play in human life, some of which are generative and life giving, and some of which are life destroying. Thanatos and your host name. I can't believe I'm saying this. Because I, I, I'm not I'm not really buying into everything that's behind it, but I do think that when we feel overwhelmed by the challenge of stemming the tide of something dying that we care about. And it can fit the same way climate change has presented us, I think, as a species. So, and it's related, right? So we, we're losing the diversity of knowledge about plants and how they grow and what you do to, to preserve your environment. Every time a language in some region dies, there's knowledge that dies perhaps with it, and it's about the natural world. And I, I actually think, I mean, I don't know what to do about it, but I, I actually think that it takes a lot of concerted effort to try and, for, as a species, try and over that destructive impulse. It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful impulse. I mean, my way comes from believing in the kind of ideal that Martin Luther King had about the idea of a beloved community. No matter how much injustice and anger you feel about it, and how much it can feel overwhelming to try and respond, that you should always hold on to hope um, that you can overcome the destructive forces that you know, endanger people. But I don't know that, you know, that's not some kind of rational argument. It's just hold on to hope in the constructive forces. I think we can use that in language sometimes. So, um, enough for 
Yeah, I would. Uh, I have to write all these notes up later. Yeah, <laughs> these yeah, are yeah, great yeah. questions. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you so much. This is super thought provoking, and I um, wanted to build a little bit on what you were mentioning about um, Mary Louise Pratt's talk because mm. I think that her work is very much in dialogue with the yeah, things that you're talking about. I'm sure. And I was wondering if maybe you could expand a little bit on um, uh, what, what you mean when you say a common human inheritance because mm. this was one of the things that she definitely talked about it, how on the one hand one argument for the preservation of different languages is um, that somehow there is this implicit link to culture which is not the same thing as identity and I thought it was very interesting how you're talking about culture as well um, uh, and so they you know you can say well there's this diversity of cultures and each one is unique just as the language is unique and therefore the preservation of language is sort of de facto the preservation of this uh, particular culture, right? I don't actually believe that. No, 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 I'm not okay. saying... I was going to say, I was going along with Ken Luca for a while. No, right, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm also saying that this was something actually that she was critiquing as well because mm -hmm. she was saying, well, how can you say that if also, on the other hand, another strong argument is also about this shared human inheritance. So I think she was actually, she was actually questioning all of it at this right. point, you know? Um, Rightly so. And it was a very interesting thing because it was, you know, this kind of work in progress, she was very generous to, to show us her, her thoughts in progress. So I just wanted to know what, yeah, how are you how are you conceiving of this idea of a common human inheritance and the relationship between that and a diversity of identities or cultures? Um, and maybe, you know, since you yourself were bringing up, you know, the, the diversity of plants, you know, how, how might those interact? This goes to the very core, so I started out talking about my two ongoing research interests. This goes to the core of the first one. Okay. For a variety of reasons, I mean, one of them is, I suppose, I realize, I mean, I haven't read Truth and Method gone in a long time, but thinking about this, I was kind of refreshing my memory, it goes to little sections, and I realize I probably have more in common with Godmer than I think about this. I don't have some kind of platonic view of there being these concepts that we're innately born knowing or having, but I do think there's something about the structure of human thought, understanding, and intelligence that makes it possible for us in conversation and dialogue with each other to articulate something that we share. Where it comes from, I'm agnostic about it. I, I used to want to say, oh, I'm platonic, I believe there probably are forms. And I don't believe that. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably more Socratic, or again, it's a, there's an agnosticism in the background. It's just that, boom, here we can accomplish this coming to agreement in a way that expands the original linguistic horizon that maybe somebody like God might talk about the fusion of horizons. Um, so I think that if that's critical, if those fusion of if the fusion of horizons is the source of knowledge in the end, and the inheritance we ought to care about, you need to protect the opportunity to interact with horizons that may not be like yours. If you hope, and this is this is Socratic, this is Godin, this is Gomer, this is Charles Taylor, if you hope to ever come to something that transcends the narrow, limited perspective that you of necessity have as a single individual. I'll give you even another piece of this. So I don't need a platonic view of forms that we all, you know, have in some of our life and we have remember recollection of the forms is what not under Educate. I don't need that view to be able to say with, there's a uh, 20th century, late 20th century uh, philosopher of language named Mark Platz, who doesn't unfortunately write much anymore, but he wrote a marvelous book called uh, Ways of Meaning, and one chapter, this I do talk about in the field of mm -hmm. places and actually other places, he comes up with this idea that one of the things that's important about morality, and I think maybe about any important set of value concepts, but morality in particular, mm -hmm. is that they are just the kind of concepts that are, he calls them, so semantically deep. He talks about semantic depth. Mm -hmm. Whatever the source of that depth, they're so semantically rich and deep that no single individual, no single human culture, linguistic community, I don't think they're the same, no single philosophical theory could ever give an exhaustive rendering of the content of that, those concepts. I think 
somehow or other we have a shared capacity to appreciate and understand some kind of finite set of moral concepts and maybe other value concepts. I am an agnostic about how. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that the pursuit of a deeper, richer understanding of our moral inheritance, just that part alone, is impossible without willingness to give respect. As an intrinsic prima facie move, and maybe, maybe cultures and individuals can show they don't merit esteem, but they mm -hmm. their respect, for the possibility that they have something to teach you about the depth of those concepts that you don't understand. And that's what I mean by common moral inheritance. I believe there just are these concepts, ranges of value concepts. Some of them are about the value of nature the value of uh, human beings. But I don't want to say just human beings. I actually think environment and uh, you know, uh, many climates, whatever you call them, can have value that we don't always appreciate. Um, and that those values are such that they're so rich and so deep that we should not presume that any one of us or any one community could ever fully articulate the truth. And I confess, you know, that means I'm, I'm a kind of objectivist about these value concepts and these domains of value concepts. But it ends up it being, I think, a way of think a theory, if you will, that makes not only makes sense of our experience, but makes sense of experience in a way that grounds the kind of uh, hopefulness that I think it's not optimism, but hopefulness mm -hmm. that I think could allow us to overtake the more destructive elements of. I mean, of our experience, I should say. So that's what I mean by common inheritance. It's not like it's there for us to just claim. Mm. It has to be articulated mm. in concert with other people, other groups, other linguistic communities. The last thing I want to say, because I don't want to keep other people from talking, mm -hmm. the one reason I resist linguistic community and culture is mm -hmm. perfectly identical, is that I do think that a person can, now these people will say they can only do it because they have a first language. But I think that people who are non-native speakers of a language can become so thoroughly proficient. People who come to dream in a second language, I'm not one of them, I'm not there. But people who can dream, who can have, you know, nightmares and, and just fantasize in a language that is not their native language in ways that suggest it's not surface proficiency. I don't know that they're inheriting a culture when they become proficient in that. Maybe it is about the first language being, so people like uh, Kim Lick will talk about the position of the, he, he calls it the first position or something like that, from which other languages can be learned. But I still think you can get pretty darn close to a proficiency in a second language or a third language, some people can do more, mm -hmm. without thereby taking a culture. And it, I don't, it doesn't diminish linguistic communities for me to say they're not the same as cultures. Um, um, I wanted to, I mean, this is really fabulous. Um, I want to, but I want to sort of step back for a second and ask you about the, um, uh, and, and you know, you brought this up, the, 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 the kind of liberal mode of argument uh, within which the, the debate about language rights are, are enmeshed, right? So it seems to me that there's sort of two positions if you think about it. And, you know, the Kimlikas and the Taylors of the world are really trying to, to perform something that seems to be the impossible. And so I'll put it in this way. Um, so one is that the, that the language or the, the place of multiculturalism within liberal democratic theory and or discourse is an argument about parity, right? It is the equal representation and or recognition and or respect for difference, with each difference being equal to the other. So it's an argument in a sense of parity, and, and so multiculturalism in that sense works through that. It seems to me that there is a bigger problem in the sense that a kind of liberal democratic framework faces, and that's actually the question of equality. Right? So, so parity is different from equality. It seems to me. Okay. So I mean, I'm just thinking through. You know, if one thinks then through something like uh, the problematic of affirmative action, mm -hmm. there the question is actually about inequality, and it's not about respect tolerance. I'm just going to create a kind of heuristic divide between the question of, of you know, incommensurability, inequality on the one side, and the question of respect, tolerance, recognition on the other. 
right? yeah. one predicated them also on some notion that you, know, you cannot have alterity within the framework of liberalism. Right? So the question then is posed, well, what if you do not recognize? What if I am illegible? What if my rights are illegible? To you, I mean, so this is this is that that fundamental question, right? Yeah. And that poses, it seems to me, I mean, it poses a real conundrum for liberal democratic theory because the substrate of these arguments are, as you're saying, the notion of a kind of common shared morality. Mm -hmm. So, what if we were to shift? And so, in some sense, that's why I said, you know, the Kimlikas of the world and the communitarian argument is a kind of retrofitting, as it were of a kind of fundamental problem right. that liberal democratic theory. I'm just sort of posing this to you. Right. So it could be language, it could be women's rights, right. right? And it could be questions of, you know, what do you do with, I don't know, Sharia in the logic of, you know, things that look law-like, right. et cetera, et cetera. So, right. you know, you've got all of the typical conundrums that get posed. So what, you know, how would we alter, or is there a way to kind of not think within this paradigm what are the kind of, it seems to me that this paradigm opens up certain kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. The possibility that it opens up is to say there is common shared humanity. Right. I don't know how I get there, but mm -hmm. it's going to be a position of risk. And it doesn't mean we all do the same thing. Yes, yeah, absolutely, right? But you see what I'm well, what I do, I'm I do. At. And so it's yeah. really a, fun, a, a kind of question then of really pushing and working with what you began with, which is to say it doesn't seem to me like the question of language rights actually is adequate to the way that we understand and express this problem. Yeah. Um, so where do we go from there? So you've, you've highlighted <laughs> right. a lot of interesting challenges in the debate around this. One dimension of your mm -hmm. comments put me in mind of at least one stage of a disagreement between Iris Young and Nancy Fraser. I was just going to be yeah. Right, where Iris Young was trying to hold out for the idea that there might still be some forms of injustice that was really critical to redress that had to do with recognition, amongst other things, and not just with things like material equality, mm -hmm. you know, culture yes. and, and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and uh, material yeah. concerns. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing I'll say. But I also, I'll also try to complicate the other point you made initially about recognition that what's at stake there isn't really some kind of robust notion of equality, but you called it parity. Mm -hmm. Because I think, mm -hmm. I've come to, I've begun thinking, because I've been worrying about people who think they'll get, so people like Charles Mills in his absolutely most recent writing on Kant, who think that you could somehow, from a Kantian perspective, make an argument for A, what is wrong with white supremacy, treatment of people of color and how to re redress it on a purely Kantian argument about respect. And I think part of the problem is mm -hmm. that it is a lack of, of concern for the reality of people's human humanness, embodiedness, their suffering in cultures, their historical narratives, their stories. And I don't think that multiculturalism is really only about respecting the culture per se. It's about taking seriously the ways in which different ways of life contain people who lead human lives. They feel pain. They suffer. They're happy sometimes, but they, you know, they go to the doctor, or their kids are sick, or they are hungry. They wonder how to make. Those are the inability to see that their uh, struggles and their problems are worth taking seriously enough to care about the equality the material quality, I think is part of what the mm -hmm. multicultural uh, theories that are the best versions of it were really trying to get at. That their way of life has a kind of internal richness and validity that you know brings forth all the human dimensions of experience that we should care about as being fellow human beings. That isn't exhausted by the idea of respect. Mm -hmm. Um, or even the idea of respect for culture per se, but for the ways of life that cultures give rise to. So I mean, I actually think that part of the problem is that the, the ways in which some multiculturalists have talked had made it seem like you have to frame what it is to care about another culture in the right way in this kind of Kantian language of rational respect. That's not irrelevant, but it's not enough. And you're not going to care, so I'll give you an example of where, I'm really, and then I'm, again, I'm going to open up to other questions. There's a new book out 
by, I think he's both a medical doctor and a sociologist, I, on his on my desk I have a right, called The uh, Dying of Whiteness. And why do I mention this book? That this is a, a man who has gone into certain communities in America, you know, uh, working class and sometimes even less economically well off than that, white Americans, who will look at him in the face and say, you know, yeah, my arguing against this welfare program means that I don't get it, but it also means that those people don't get it either. <laughs> those immigrants or those blacks or those whoever. And part of what it is to say to me is that it is an inability to see the common humanness of those people mm -hmm. that is standing in the way, not only of the idea of equality for others, but even of one's own self-concern. Mm -hmm. And I think until we can break, break down the barriers that lead to the us and them part, the, oh, when, if they're speaking Spanish in line, then it means I should feel offended. I don't think so. But why do you feel that way? And particularly, why do you feel that it's really rational somehow to so want to see the other suffer and so and to be so inattentive to the moral weight of that suffering? But you'd be willing to put yourself at risk as well. It's just an extraordinary fact. And as I said, I haven't read the book. I've seen the guy interviewed. I think it was on um, what's the Morning Joe. I think I saw. I confess, I have, I have different kind of shows I watch for different yeah. moments. And Morning Joe is sometimes one of them. And sometimes I can't. I'm not so big on Joe Scarborough, but but they bring people on that are interesting, and they give them actually a little time. So does that help? That I think That's part of it is. You know, I, I'm not sure I remember all of Iris Yale's arguments here, but I think she was it, trying it to say that, 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 that right? sometimes it is about symbolic way. expression in a culture and the messages mm -hmm. it sends about who matters mm -hmm. that is as critical to, the, to making an argument about why the equality of these people matters, why their access to equal opportunity matters, why employment, why, et cetera, matters. Yeah. I hope that seems yeah. reasonable. Yeah. Right. I, and I did, I'm not going to... But I just wanted to, to add really quickly, though. It seems that part of the issue at large, uh, at least like from, from my own observations, is that uh, it's the respect that is is appealed to now or, or evoked, what people are saying, it's, it's not reciprocity so much as it has to do with authority. Uh, I think, and that, that's where it gets tricky because okay. I feel that when I encounter those kinds of arguments, too, for people, you know, it's not you. I, it's not for them. And, like I think it's it, it's coming from a place of actually fundamentally feeling disrespected because they're not seen as authorities on something. And so that I think that's a whole nother. That's a whole other thing. It's, it's, it's there. Crept onto the it's there. Question it's there. Too, but to open it up. It's about the loss of a sense of um, political power and right. they argue that their interests are going to be automatically dominant. That's a new position yeah. for them to be in. And you know, part of me says I understand that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't understand how somebody can't make you see that they're the logical consequence of that in policies is that you're damaging your own interests as well. And then what that means is if you can come to see your own interests differently, you might well come to see the interests of the people you other right. as different as well. Okay. Sorry. So just to push you a little bit on the right, sure. because this, you said at one stage of the game, rights can't capture. Uh, Related, and I sort of wonder about okay. that, you see, because quite honestly, what I was thinking of when you said that was the Uyghur, the, the Uyghur in China. Oh, okay. Tell me more about because I don't know. Well, what you got there then is a very strong effort by the state to destroy a culture, with millions of people being in these education schools and oh, things like right. that. So, so that's yeah. that's. That's the type of problem, I think, that rights has to deal with, you see, because right. I've always been interested in the sort of spectrum of, of, of justice, where right. one end of the game is sort of, I say, merely ethical, right. and the other end of the game is seriously criminal, you see. Right. And so, where are you? <laughs> so you asked me a good question that gave me the opportunity to reiterate what I am not quite as forceful about in the paper. I'm not against the idea of universal human rights. I really meant that, that there's something powerful, both about the theoretical notion that there is this weighty obligation on, on states to protect certain interests that people have, and that some states have come to accept, at least in theory and learned practice, that they have these obligations. I think civil and political rights, which is what I think is primarily at 
mistake in the case you I'm not saying there may not be language issues as well, but if people are being imprisoned and if people are being confined and constrained, that isn't only about preventing access to language. That's about limiting freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of various kinds that I think are associated with civil and political rights. But, but, Those, I think, ha cannot be protected because they're about pushing back against state intervention that's damaging and harmful. They're about saying you as a state have an absolute duty not to do this. And I actually think if any universal human rights are absolute, the ones that come closest are the civil and political rights, maybe some welfare, social welfare rights. Yes, I can accept that, but again, it's, where is that coming from? It's coming from the particular group's identity. Right. And I think language and culture very integral. Oh, I won't state. deny and that. Therefore, yeah. you know, in other words, that, that it might be yes. In this case, we're putting him in prison. Right. All, all the same, the real driving position is around language, and that's why I want to sort of want to push you into seeing that so, in terms of justice, not just well. You know, choice, it, it may be that I don't know enough. I mean, I have just a kind of skeletal knowledge of this. I don't know enough. In, my memory of it is that it isn't only about, if it were, you would just force them to learn a different language. You don't have to imprison them. <coughs> yeah, I suppose my language goes with culture. La of course it goes with it, but my argument is the ground of their, their confinement mm -hmm. is not essentially that they speak language as, it's that they represent a whole way of life that has, not, that we don't want to see preserved. That I don't think is actually about language rights at all. I think that's about civil and political rights. I think it's the same thing that goes on again and again when there is genocide or ethnic cleansing. I mean, we've seen it, you know, from, it is very much, I think, in its mass scale, it's a 20th and 21st century phenomenon, but I don't think those movements are ever solely about language even if the language be their access to it and its very existence as a separate linguistic community is in question. I think why they are being targeted goes far beyond the fact that they speak a particular language. Oh, I agree with that. And in fact, that's why I was pushing back on the language, on linguistic communities and cultures, because I think there is something else that people are worried about. You know, um, you could talk about Nazi Germany and the build up to the um, demonization of people in certain cultural and ethnic and religious groups. It wasn't only about their language, it was basically about who they were and what they represented as a quote unquote non German, you know, not true Germanness mm -hmm. um, that, that was at issue. And I, th I think that's a very different thing that language comes in, but language is not the ground for me. Yeah, but now you make me want to read more about this group. I mean, I'm sorry to hear that this this goes on. We know it goes on. And I, I, I think the idea of rights actually has much to offer in this context. Yes, so that's actually a great segue for what I want to ask about. This came up a little bit at our last I, uh, ICLS meeting. Okay. When I think about rights, this uh, comes from me. I, I teach uh, US legal principles to foreign lawyers at Fordham Law. Okay. And we uh, sort of think of the American system of civil rights versus the post-World War II European system. That is, here, for the most part, your rights are negative. You have the right not to. So this would be a great case where you should have the right to speak Spanish in a bodega and not have anyone harass you. You should have a right to use your weaker language and not be imprisoned. And I think most people would agree that providing negative rights is fairly easy to do mm -hmm. because it's not costing anybody money. You're right. just making sure the government doesn't affirmatively go in and mess with people's lives. Positive rights, the word comes up in the legal context, and now this is coming in for my work in applied linguist, it tends to be uh, really two cases. One is education in your mother tongue, and the other would be interactions with the legal system in your mother tongue. And providing that kind of right is where it gets complicated and can conflict with other rights and gets really, really, really expensive sometimes. So. Um, so when I sort of think of do we want there to be lang you know recognized language as a human right, it sort of depends on well where are we going to be enshrining these rights? A lot of UN human rights tend to be non-binding resolutions anyway, where no one really has to do anything. If you're going to talk about it, you know, if you're going to add a new language bill of right, would that be a negative right or a positive right, and how would that affect the way it plays out? Um, and then I guess finally an entirely separate problem in this 
sorry to switch topics a little bit, but I thought what Amy said about language suicide was really interesting, and that is when we in um, the School of Education are looking at implementing an L1-based education program, interestingly, the people L1, who, uh, mother tongue, okay. first language, uh, the people who tend to be most opposed are the people who speak the endangered language. And yeah. they are committing suicide. Yes, I've been reading about this. I mean, everyone has read about sort of, you know, the- Linguicide? Maybe. Linguicide, the, the terrible schools where Native American children were beaten for speaking their own languages. And yes, of course, that happened and it's bad, but in the modern world, languages die because people leave their language and they want to learn Spanish or Russian or Mandarin so they can get a better job, so their kids can get a better job. And it really is a Western uh, uh, ethical system that thinks these languages should be preserved. Okay. It's often, I, I also work at the Endangered Language Alliance, and it's often we'll get someone from a part of the world where they speak an endangered language, and they never value it at all until right. they came here and had a bunch of professors salivating, oh, can you get language samples <laughs> in your beautiful language? Um, yeah. and, and there really is a sense of language suicide. Right. So, sorry, those are two very different well, topics. Oh, there's a lot of topics. To <laughs> so, let me, let me get to the one, because first of all, it was not on the second one about the language itself, endangered versus native tongue. It was not without reason that I think you have to keep the problem of responding to multilingualism in a place where not every language that's in question is endangered, or even maybe none of them are, and responding, quote unquote, to the problem of endangered languages broadly. The second thing I'll say about that, and I'll get back to, to, to the, the way to characterize rights and the challenges of the difference between them, is that I think We've got to remember, this is one thing that is implicit in the federal film work in familiar places. We have this vision, even of cultures, but certainly of what it is to see ourselves as members of cultures, that is about constricting and confining and limiting people. And you can see yourself as a member of Culture X and also think that there are things I can do that people who are in my cultural community wouldn't do. That doesn't have to mean I'm no longer of that community. We have this idea of authenticity in culture that sometimes is good because it can be a way for the group to protect itself from the outside. But the danger is inside we ignore and, and forget the fact that a living culture is always going to have internal to it arguments about what's the best way for that culture to go forward. And I can imagine someone saying, I mean, I was reading a lot, in fact, this morning about the kind of first, second, first generation, second generation, third generation process whereby immigrants to the U.S. and maybe to Australia tend by almost, almost without fail to be the third generation, they don't want to speak it at all anymore, and then they have to relearn it as a foreign language. So part of it is I can think that you can be an authentic member of a cultural community that may be coincident with a linguistic community and not believe that you have to, in everyday speech, use only that language to be authentic. Some people may want to, may believe they lose too much, um, but I, I want to say, and then, so that's the other thing I'd say. And you notice it was also with, not without reason that I did not come down on one side of the question of education in the mother tongue. I think it's an open question. There are theorists of you know, justice who insist that there's no way, particularly when communities with some linguistic characteristics, <coughs> excuse me, may also be socioeconomically very disadvantaged. That you may not be doing any child in that community a favor by demanding that they go to school the first language they're learning in is the mother tongue. It may be that that learning of that language, not that it's intrinsically a bad thing, but it is cutting them off. And they, they're too young to choose, of course, and families don't always know what's at stake. Thirdly on this, I'll also say, that you know there are people who, without the prodding of uh, sociolinguists, moved to New York. You know, 800 languages spoken mm -hmm. within the 12 mile radius. There are people who come here and they discover they're like the last of 50 people who speak a language, mm -hmm. and they don't need a person to tell them that they're going to lose something, mm -hmm. and that you know there are people who on every holiday will then try, even when there's only one person in the room who understands it, they want to keep some of that past going. Mm -hmm. There are some who never do it but for the prodding of a linguist, but I don't think there's some uniform uh, pattern there. So then finally, the civil rights and, so, and the other rights, it is no secret that in the U.S. context there's been a profound resistance to what in U.N. parlance might be called social welfare. <coughs> rights to education, uh, rights to health care, 
rights to um, food, right? food security. Um, I could give other even employment. There is, it is no secret. I mean, we're fighting that out now in our current uh, political discourse. And it's, but the needle is moving. The needle is, I mean, in ways that I never imagined I would hear some people who say they don't believe in socialism mm -hmm. say, but you know, maybe we ought to acknowledge it right there. <coughs> so the needle is moving, but I don't deny. You know, the, it's interesting to know that there were people um, interpreting John Rawls's theory of justice, even back in the 70s, um, Michaelman, Frank Michaelman, who was trying to argue that if you understood the commitments of Rawls's view, where Rawls had never been willing to talk about some substantive notion of social welfare rights, Michaelman was trying to argue that he should be, and that he should be ready to acknowledge that when you read, for instance, the U.S. Constitution, you would, <laughs> particularly the, the Bill of Rights, <laughs> that you would have to see yourself pulled over into the realm. But of course, that's not the consensus for interpreting. Um, and, but as I said, I've been amazed how even in this moment where some things are pulling well back, even away from civil rights, that there is another form of discourse that's now airing the idea of social rights. Mm -hmm. And health care, you know, access to employment. People are even talking about a universal basic income. I don't know that that's ever going to happen. I mean, it's not Switzerland. And it's never happened there. I guess they've discussed it. Uh, and it's not Belgium and wherever else, but the needle is moving. Mm -hmm. oh. If we move, move past that. Oh, no, I don't mind like going so back. back. No, 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 there's no, no. It, it's, yeah. it's it was just picking up on the comment about the Uyghurs. I was just um, going to mention that, yes, indeed, um, the issue is uh, beyond the linguistic identity of the Uyghur group, but also their religious identity because it's a Muslim group. Yes, and I then, thought it was Islam. Yes. And also, it's a different ethnic group within China and that some of the tactics um, that have been used in the United States with labeling uh, groups enemy combatants have been used very specifically to target um, and try to attempt to justify the uh, terrors visited upon this minority group. You know, I wasn't sure because it's not my area of expertise and I thought it had a connection to the persecution of Muslims in China. Um, but I wasn't sure, and you've actually, so now I know I need to read more about it just to kind of uh, just try to see how you might parcel out the different parts of the, the problem. But thank you for, for Did you have another question? Well, it was interesting, too, to ties in with um, your earlier remarks about the power of the image. I'm thinking about uh, China's repression of the Tibetan uh, people and how just as they were forbidden to speak the Tibetan language, Forbidden to show Tibetan imagery, iconography, images of the Dalai Lama, etc. You're right, and it is a sense that these things go together, and language is a really critical element of it. But you can see when you see how it's connected to other kinds of things they're trying to prohibit and suppress, that language only captures, that, that language only reveals mm -hmm. one dimension of what it is that is deemed um, something that can't be protected or allowed to flourish in society. That's a frightening thing. That's a frightening thing. It really is. Because the other dimension is the, the right, the genocide, the convention on the right against genocide. Language is one of the criteria. Right. Oh, no, I understand that. But you put the phrase one of the criteria. Yeah. Well, it is a reminder that it, language becomes part of a very interesting complex of phenomena that are targeted efforts to, you know, to destroy mm -hmm. people, to remove them from the face of the earth, or at least from your, mm -hmm. from your uh, cultural world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this incredibly oh, rich well, Thank you. Wow. Uh, and thank you all, too, for all okay. your